نحمده و نسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم سلوا وسلم بارك على سيدنا لان محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله for the next few days we'll be coming from a I guess a different venue uh, basically we're here at the Islamic Center of Griffin or Islamic Community Center of Griffin uh, and uh, so next few recordings will be from here inshallah uh, before I you know the intention today is to start talking about Musa alayhi salam uh, and before we start into that uh, just a few words that I want to say and something that I should have said before in sort of Yusuf uh, or about Yusuf alayhi salam which I which I forgot one is that you know of course doing this in this format uh, you know, we're just recording, uh, you know, kind of talking into a blank. Uh, mind kind of drifts sometimes, and of course, you know, even other times, you know, you say things, you're thinking one thing and you're saying something else. Uh, and if there's no one there to catch you, then it's very hard. And this is why if you look at traditionally, you know, when the Muslim scholars, or which I'm not a scholar, but when the Muslim scholars would speak, or when you'd have a khatib or anyone speaking, you know, you'd have people there who could check him. Uh, so if he misspoke, then they would catch him right away and, and take care of things. And this was this made it easier on the speaker, uh, and it's also good for everybody involved. And so, uh, and of course, in this format, you don't we don't have that unfortunately, uh, and it's kind of hard to um, kind of proof yourself. Like even if you're proofreading a paper that you wrote, uh, it's very hard to pick up on the mistakes because again, in your mind, it's one thing. Uh, and so as you're reading it, you just kind of, you, you mentally go through it in that manner, even though it may have come out like a typo or something may have come out on the paper. Uh, same thing if some, sometimes, again, when I'm thinking one thing, but the words are coming out differently, uh, it's very hard to correct myself. Uh, so if you see something like that, let me know, uh, so that we can fix things, inshallah. You know, this is uh, you know, this is not an issue of ego or oh, you know, it doesn't matter if I say it wrong, it's still right. Uh, this is you know, again, we're talking about Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and His prophets. Uh, and so uh, you know, if if I you know. Because even sometimes, you know, you know a verse very well, uh, but again, mind drifts and you missay it. Uh, and if you kind of get plugged into that, it just kind of, you know, the error kind of uh, uh, expands uh, afterwards. But, uh, you know, and those who, like even like the Imam, when he's leading Salat, uh, if he makes a mistake, you know, it's the responsibility of those listening to him to correct him if they know. Uh, and the Imam uh, should not feel bad or should not feel like, oh, you know, uh, why are you correcting me? Because this is, this is a check and balance system within the, within the religion. You know, a true check and balance system. Uh, so, so we need to keep this in mind, inshallah. One of the things that I forgot to mention, because again, also in this format, you know, when you're, when you're talking to people, you can gauge you know whether they understand what you're saying or not and if they don't then you can expound on that uh, in this format you know if I, uh, it's hard to gauge that 
but the other aspect of it is, you know, sometimes you think, oh, the people know this, and you just kind of keep moving on when they may not know it. Uh, so, you know, if we look at the story of Yusuf al Islam and his brothers, you know, the brothers of Yusuf al Islam plotted to kill him. You know, initially there were the plan, the initial plan was to kill him until the oldest of them or the eldest of them said, you know, let's not kill him, let's just throw him in a well. You know, we don't want the sin of killing him upon us. Uh, and so they all agreed. But uh, the normally if you look at that, you know, to plot against a prophet or a messenger of Allah, uh, and especially to plot to kill him, you know, is one of those sins that uh, is is inexcusable, and especially if you know who it is. You know, but we see in the situation in Yusuf al Islam's story that his brothers repent, are able to repent, and are forgiven. You know, someone who is disrespectful to Rasulullah Sallallahu and this is specific for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Allah in Surah Adab, in Surah Hujarat, Surah number 49, he talks about this right at the beginning, addressing the believers. And when he talks about honoring and respecting the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says in the end, he says, Anta ahbata amalikum wa antum la tashurun. You know, that you're, you're, you know, if you are disrespectful to him after knowing who he is, then your deeds will be wiped away and you won't even perceive it, meaning you won't even be able to repent for it because the first step in repentance is to acknowledge you've made a mistake. And yet for someone who is disrespectful to Rasulullah after knowing that he is the Messenger of Allah, you know, after, you know, acknowledging that he is the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is why the verses all start off with Ya Yuhladina Amanu, O you who believe. Then again the end is that your deeds will be wiped away and you won't perceive it, meaning you won't even be able to make tawbah for it. Which is also interesting because shirk is one of those sins that is unforgivable. You know, meaning that if somebody dies upon shirk, then he will not be forgiven in the hereafter. You know, so he's committed shirk and he dies on that belief of associating partners with Allah you know, or ascribing divinity to something other than or someone other than Allah then if he dies on that he won't be forgiven however the door of repentance remains open for him you know throughout his life until his last breath but being disrespectful to Rasulullah is one of those sins after knowing who he is, after acknowledging that he is the Messenger of Allah, and then you are disrespectful to him, the door of Tawbah has been closed. That your deeds will be wiped away and you won't even perceive it. You know, because the first step in Tawbah is to perceive you made a mistake. In the story of Yusuf salam, you know, they plot to kill him. You know, and if and not okay, then they agree, okay, we won't kill him, let's just get rid of him. You know, so they they are planning against the a prophet of Allah. And again, yet in the end they are forgiven. Why? You know, that door of repentance remained open for them and they not only well, not only remained open for them, but they walked through that door. Why? You know, if you look, you realize this part of it in the beginning and part of it in the end. In the end, when Yusuf al-Islam addresses them, you know, before they realize, oh, this is Yusuf al-Islam, he, he, what does he ask them? He said, what did you do to Yusuf and his brother when you were ignorant? Meaning you didn't know that he is a prophet. But they did all of this so that is one part is they didn't know that he was a prophet but they did all of this for what reason you know Rasulullah has ta taught us in al-a'malu bin niyat that every action is by its intention the purpose behind the action of these ten brothers was to get Yusuf al-Islam away out of the way so that their father would focus his love upon them 
So they, they did all of this to gain the love of their father, who is a prophet. So in reality, they did all of this to gain the love of a prophet of Allah. You know? And this is why that door remained open for them, and not only remained open for them, but they were allowed to walk through that door of forgiveness. And so this is a very important point to understand here. So now coming to the story of Musa al -Islam. You know, if you look at the story of Musa al -Islam in the Qur'an, you know, it is mentioned throughout the Qur'an. You know, I mean, various places, multiple times, over and over and over again, various aspects of the story. And if you look at the story of Musa al-Islam in the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the Hadith of Rasulullah sallam, there are more different narrations as far as more different incidences mentioned about the story of Musa al-Islam than even in the books of those who claim to follow Musa al-Islam. Yeah. Of course, you know, as we mentioned when we talked about, about Yusuf al-Islam, the story of Yusuf al-Islam is the only story of a prophet in the Qur'an that is summarized or, or basically given in context in one place. Whereas the story of Musa al-Islam is throughout the Qur'an in various places throughout the Qur'an and, and, and covering various aspects of his story. Which becomes an issue for some of the non-believers. They say, oh, you know, it would be nice if it was just in one place, you know, like a story. But again, the Qur'an is not a storybook. The, pur the purpose behind the stories is not to know the story. The purpose behind the stories is to learn from them and to apply them to our lives. Take those lessons from the story and then apply them. You know. now, I'm not going to go into the, all of the details of all the stories in the Qur'an about Musa al uh, Because that would take a long time. Uh, and for those who know me, I'm kind of in a rush to get to the story of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But of course, all of these are connected, and all of these stories, including the story of Musa al-Islam, is pointing us toward Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, today, inshallah, I'm just going to start about the begin, talk about the beginning, up to the point where he uh, goes to Madain. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we look at the story, you know, of course, the story starts off with, you know, of course, the birth of Musa, his, his maulid. But even before that, you know, we see that the children of Israel are highly concentrated within Egypt. And this, of course, was because of Yusuf, you know, when he you know, was essentially leading there then most of the children of Israel left Canaan and came to Egypt and settled there. In the beginning they were treated well, but then as time passed and especially after the passing of Yusuf you know, you see this sudden shift where now they are being treated as slaves. You know, they are under the control and captivity of Fir'aun, and of course there are many Fir'auns, but during this time of Musa al-Islam, you know, we talk about one specific Fir'aun, uh, but uh, who is, you know, varying scholars, most of whom say he was Ramses the second. If we look again, you know, you kind of think, okay, well why, or people wonder, why did they go suddenly from being you know, an honored society to now being slaves and captives. You know, it doesn't take long for society to, de to degrade. And we're seeing this today, you know, like even now with the coronavirus issue going on. You know, you have this lockdown. And you had, you had, you had communities, you know, like even here in Atlanta, you know, that were being rebuilt, being brought up, you know, being revitalized and now everything is on hold and those same communities that were now coming up and becoming prosperous have suddenly declined back to the way they were 20-30 years ago you know as far as 
you know, the actions of the people in those communities. Uh, and so, you know, degrading or going to chaos doesn't take very long. You know, holding the balance and order is something that takes force. You know, and normally I would say say it takes effort, but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nothing takes effort. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the force. I mean when we look at the universe, we look at the order in the universe. You know, why aren't the planets colliding with each other, you know, and even though they pass by each other so closely, you know, you have asteroids going by and we had a recent asteroid that went by that you know, that was very close, you know, but it didn't collide. So you have all of these asteroids moving, you have planets moving, you have stars, you have all of this in the universe, and yet nothing is colliding with each other. Why not? You know, the natural order would be chaos. And order doesn't come out of chaos. You know, just like ignorance doesn't, or, or intelligence doesn't come out of ignorance. You know, the force behind all of this, of course, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, society the same way, it doesn't take long, if you leave it alone, it's going to degrade. And so that's what happened in Egypt. You had a, a, a group within the society that were honored, suddenly now becoming enslaved and captives. And this is the situation of Bani Israel. So, so when this Fir'aun, who was a tyrant who claimed to be the God Most High, you know, the Lord Most High, the highest of the Lords, you know, because money corrupts and power corrupts. And somebody who thinks they have absolute power and absolute, you know, and all the wealth, well, you know, you can imagine their mindset. And, you know, and, you know, people forget their limitations. You know, say, I can do anything. Well, no, you can't. You know, you can do anything within certain boundaries. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, He has given us free will, but even the free will is within certain boundaries. You know, to think that, oh, I can do this and I can do that, well, you know, everybody ends up in the grave. And then what are you going to do? So, some of Fir'aun's advisors had told him, had foretold him, you know, and this was, you know, basically the soothsayers and stuff, and you know, we've talked about how these people used to get their knowledge and how their knowledge was in certain ways very accurate uh, when we talked about Ibrahim So you have a similar situation that happened at, at the time of uh, Ibrahim with Namrud, you know, where Namrud had ordered all of the, the males be killed because he knew that you know, this boy was going to be, be born who was going to overthrow his kingdom. So now the same thing with Fir'aun with Fir and Musa -Islam, that Fir'aun is told that look you know this boy is about to be born and who's going to destroy your kingdom. You know, we can't have that. You know. And they also told him that he would be born in an odd year, numbered year or whatever their numbering system was. So basically every other year Fir'aun would order that all of the male children born this year are to be killed. You know, and the females would be left alive. You know, he couldn't stop them from being born, so he said, well, let's just kill them. Again, he is the Lord Most High, uh, so he can't do that, but he's going to kill them. And so the year that Musa al -Islam was born was one of these odd years. So this was the year that all of these children are to be wiped out. You know, all the male children will be killed. And so he gives the order. And what people don't think about in the situation of Namrud, it was kind of random. You know, he didn't prepare. Fir'aun is a different mindset and as far as that is concerned. He is a much more organized king. You know, if you look at that, you know, we can kind of understand what he did by simply looking at what happened recently in China. You know, when they had the one child policy, you had a whole system. You, know, you had a whole uh, department of the government dedicated to this one task. In fact, in China, that, that department employed half a million people, you know, just to make sure that there, were not, there wasn't more than one child to each family. 
you know, Pharaoh had a system. So in his system, they would go around, the government officials, you know, they had certain department that would deal with this, and they would go and check on, on families and see, okay, who's expecting. And if they found out some woman was expecting a child, they would go and visit her frequently. You know, and then you know, they would know when time was due, and when it was, they would go check on it and see if it's a male or a female. And if it was a male, he, you know, the child would be killed. So you have this system in place and the mother of Musa a.s. Uh, is of course expecting. It is that year and even before he is born Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspires upon the mother of Musa a.s. that look you know this is don't worry. Um, of course, you know, the, the government officials would come, they would check on her, okay, it's almost time, it's almost time. And the interesting thing is when he was born. So when Musa al-Islam is born, the woman that was assigned to that household, when she came and checked on him and she sees him, she sees his beauty and just falls in love with him and she says, oh, you know, I can't do anything about this child. I can't, you know, if they if they know that it's a boy, they'll come and kill him. So, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He talks about how He caused their hearts to lean toward Him. And so, <clears throat> so, so she goes back and reports, yeah, the baby's been born, but it's a girl. So the ministry there for some reason weren't very satisfied and so they sent another delegation to go check and in certain narrations when this delegation came you know the mother of Musa al-Islam placed him in the oven and so they couldn't you know they didn't see him uh, and the oven did not burn him this is a characteristic of the prophets of Allah. Yeah. Which they can change when they need to. So that delegation leaves. Now, of course, there's still that threat that someone's going to come and check on him. And Allah SWT inspires into the heart of Musa, the mother of Musa al Islam, that look, you know when you fear for him then put him in a box and throw him in the, the box in the river and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tells her that we are going to take him to our enemy and his enemy you know and he will be raised in this condition but he also promises her that we will return him to you you know if you look at the birth or talk the 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 incidences around the birth of, of Musa al-Islam, they're contained in mainly two places in the Quran, Surah Taha, uh, Surah number 20, and Surah Qasa, Surah number 28. You know, in Surah number 28, you start from verse 7 and you go forward. Uh, but, uh, the box that he was placed in, there are narrations that this box was actually built by Jibreel al-Islam. Uh, and this box would later on become, uh, uh, eventually become Tabut e Sakina or the Ark of the Covenant. And so she, when Jabril al-Islam brings this box, the mother of Musa al-Islam places him in the box and, and takes him to the river and puts him in. And then she comes back. But her heart, of course, you know, she's yearning for her child. Uh, and, you know, she, you know, to the extent that now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the verses that, you know, she almost gave him up in the sense that she almost went out saying, oh, no, this is my child, you know. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthened her faith. But she tells her daughter, go and follow Musa, alayhi salam. 
And the name Musa actually means the one taken out of the water. And so the sister of Musa al Islam follows her, follow, I mean, follows him as he's floating down the river. And as he's floating down the river, he comes to the palace of Fir'aun. You know, and there was a part of the palace that went over the river. And so when they see this box floating down the river, and then they see this child in the box, they pull him out. And Fir'aun and his wife, main wife, Asya, had no children. And when she sees him, she falls, immediately falls in love with him, this beautiful child. And she says to Fir'aun, let's not kill him, don't kill him. You know, because this, this child, maybe he'll be of use to us, you know, or maybe later we will adopt him as a son because they had no children. Fir'aun, from a worldly standpoint, is no, no, is no one's fool. You know, if you look at uh, Fir'aun, uh, you know, you don't get to that position uh, or that level of, uh, of uh, hierarchy and being a king and being a tyrant king, you know, by not, without being a little paranoid. Uh, and so, of course, Fir'aun, he knows, okay, this child is, born, is going to be born. And in his mind, this must be that child. And he wants to kill him. Of course, you know, his wife is saying, oh, no, you know, let's not kill him. Let's, let's take him in. Of course, Fir'aun also, looking at the child's beauty, uh, is captivated by it. But again, he loves his kingdom more. And so... He says to his wife, he says, okay, you know, I won't kill him under one condition. Then I'm going to put him through a test, and if he passes the test, then we'll keep him. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to kill him. And the test was that he placed in front of Musa al-Islam a diamond and a burning coal. And he said that if this is the one who is going to overthrow me, who's going to destroy my kingdom, then he will, he will reach for the diamond, for the jewel. However, if this is not that child, then he will reach for the burning coal. And so Musa al-Islam, when both of these things are placed before him, you know, he's of course a child, an infant, you know, he starts reaching for the jewel. You know, Jabila Islam takes his hand and makes him go for the, the burning coal. And so when he grabs the coal, he actually puts it in his mouth. And this is why later on he would speak, you know, with an imp with, uh, you know, his speech was not clear because he burned his tongue. You know, Fir'aun now is thinking, well, you know, if this is a child that's going to overthrow me, I mean, this can't be that child because that child is going to be very intelligent. You know. So this child not only reached for the coal, he actually stuck it in his mouth. And so he says, okay, you know, we're not going to, this fine, we're going to keep the child. But now, okay, the child needs, needs milk, needs to nurse. So let's find somebody who can nurse him. So they start calling people and everybody's coming to try to nurse this child, you know, because if they can nurse the child, now they're going to be employed within the household of Fir'aun, well paid, you know, good accommodations, all of these things. And Musa al-Islam will not nurse from anybody. Uh, and now they're getting scared, well, this, this beautiful child, you know, if he doesn't nurse, he's going to die. So, so they're desperate to find somebody that can nurse this child. This is when the sister of Musa al-Islam comes in. And she says to the wife of Fir'aun, she says to him, she says, I will, I will get somebody from whose household he will nurse. Yeah. It won't be any problem. And I know that household. So he said, well, who, it is? who is it? Let's go. Let's go. So now, you know, in modern day terms, a limousine is sent for the mother of Musa you know, and she is brought to the house of, uh, to the palace of Fir'aun, 
you know, in all of this uh, glamour. Uh, and, you know, she immediately takes her son. Of course, they don't know it's her son, but she takes her own son and she nurses him and he nurses without any problems. And so, you know, if you look at the, the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, if Musa al-Islam had stayed hidden with his mother, you know, even if the, pal if the authorities of Firaun hadn't come for him and he had not been killed, well, he would have grown up, uh, you know, the condition of the household was not financially very strong. So now Fir'aun is raising Musa, or is having Musa, not raising, but is having Musa al-Islam raised in his palace, paying his, you know, the woman to nurse him who happens to be his mother. Yeah. I mean, you know, the irony of the whole situation. Uh, which shows you the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because this couldn't just have happened by circumstances. Uh, and so, you know, we see this, and you know, I thought I was going to get a little further ahead uh, than I did today. Uh, but I'm going to stop here, inshallah. Uh, I don't want to make these things too long. So we'll see, you know, Musa al-Islam being raised in the, uh, you know, in the palace of, of Fir'aun. Uh, and by his own mother, you know. Uh, and so, inshallah, we'll talk about that and continue from here next time. Uh, may Allah SWT allow us to understand and for him to, uh, you know, give us the understanding that is correct, uh, which leads us closer to him and his beloved uh, messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. اللهم صل على سيدنا وعلى محمد وعلى آل سيدنا سيدنا وعلى محمد بارك سم سلام عليه ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرية ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا ذلمنا أنفسنا وإذلم توفي لنا وترحمنا لنكون من الخاسرين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وفي عذاب النار يا الله guide us to the straight path and allow us to uh, follow and your and love your beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as he should be loved and as he should be followed, uh, and fill our hearts with his love and the love of his uh, his family and his companions and all of those whom you love, uh, and allow us to uh, uh, come back to you in a condition where you are pleased with us and we are pleased with you, uh, and to be able to recognize your beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam in our graves when we are asked about him and to kiss his feet uh, and to uh, and and allow us to be those uh, and, uh, who will gather under his banner on the day of judgment uh, and who will who will uh, uh, for whom he will intercede uh, in, in our favor. Wa sallallahu taala ala khair khalqhi Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi jamiin bi rahmatihi ar-rahmin.